Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, being with us today online. It has been a uh, crazy week. This past week, I was uh, out of town with uh, my family for spring break. And you might be thinking to yourself, uh, man, his face is really red. Is he okay? Yes, I was, uh, I was snow skiing with my family. And so that red is from the slopes. And uh, anyway, I was reading the reports and, and, and seeing some different things online and uh, just thinking about what to do as a church. And I'm so grateful uh, that we can gather online together. Uh, just to say the straight reality is um, you can never cancel the church because the church is not a building that you come and sit in. It's a movement that you choose to be part of to help people meet, know, and, and follow Jesus. You can't come to church because the church is, is you. And so we, we, we can't cancel the church. We're never going to cancel the church. You can't do that. What we're doing is just changing the way that we, that we gather. Uh, a couple of reasons for that, just to say it out loud. Uh, we serve people here at Sun Valley, five different locations, 19 services every weekend. Thousands of people gather and we serve people from zero years of age all the way to 100, 100 plus and uh, we want to care for everyone. I don't ever want to do anything that would put any of our people in harm's way. And so uh, with all the reports coming out and, and suggestions of uh, large groups not gathering, you know, the NBA was suspended. They've canceled uh, spring training games. All of that, we just prayed about what's, what's the wise thing to do. And we just decided to gather online this weekend. And so thank you for joining us. I did see this on a uh, little window into my soul here. I did see this on social media. There was somebody, you know, saying these churches that are larger, you know, and they're, they're gathering online instead of coming together. Why don't they trust Jesus instead of being afraid and, and all that? Let, let me just, let me just say this uh, clearly. Um, a prophet just has to worry about preaching, but pastors concern themselves not just with preaching, but with, with people. And we're gathering online because I love you. I, I saw one guy on social media, you know, Jesus was around lepers, you know, and the churches should gather. Jesus was around lepers, but he didn't like feed the 5,000 and then say, hey, all 5,000 of us, let's go to the leper colony, okay? That's not the way he, he did it. Uh, we're still finding out things about what's going on. We just wanna be wise. Sincerely, I love you and, and care for you. And uh, we just decided this would be the, the best thing to do for this weekend. And we are not afraid, but we do want to be wise. And so thank you for joining us on, online. Uh, when I was out of town and uh, skiing and all that, I was getting some texts from some of the civic leaders that I know in our community, as well as other pastors. And they were saying, you know, this is, this is unprecedented. And um, I want to say a couple of things about that, and then I want to share some things with you from God's Word. Um, we've dealt with viruses and, and things before. Um, it, when it comes to the word unprecedented, it, it seems to me, and this is opinion, what, what's unprecedented is our reaction to this. It seems like the, the fear is, is unprecedented. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, is the power of, of perspective, the power of, of perspective. If we're going to move from panic to peace, that shift is all about perspective. Perspective is massive to our experience in life. Perspective is how we choose to view things, how we choose to, to see things. The power of perspective. So my family and I flew home Friday night so that I could speak to you this weekend. And uh, on the way home, I was looking at uh, some social media and I saw all these lines, you know, at Costco and, and, you know, running out of toilet paper and all that kind of stuff and people, you know, getting ready to kind of hunker down. And uh, at the same time, we got an email that uh, schools uh, were going to be suspended for a, a time. Again, the power of perspective. So I'm, I'm looking online at lines at Costco and running out of toilet paper, and then I'm hearing my 11-year-old, upon finding out that school was going to be suspended, he said, yes, spring break continues, right? That's the power of perspective. And it could be that you're thinking, well, Chad, you know, you're 11 year old, you know, spring break continues and, and all that. Ignorance is bliss. And, and that's true. 
But here's what my son knows. He knows that I'm going to take care of him, that his mom's going to take care of him. And he has this belief system, this perspective that is reality, that there is a greater force more powerful than him that cares for him and will provide for him. And can I just say this to you if you're a Jesus follower? You have a heavenly father who loves you and and cares for you. And I want to talk to you today about kind of rising above seeing everything through eyes of fear and shifting to looking at life through eyes of faith. I want to talk to you about changing your perspective. Because no matter where you've been or what you've done or what's been done to you, God loves you and and cares for you. And he has a purpose and a plan for your life. My 17-year-old this, this past week said, you know, Dad, is the world coming to an end? Is this it? What does the Bible say? And do you know when the world's going to come to an end and all that? And I just, no, I, I don't. I don't know when the world's going to come to an end. But think about this with me. I could probably guess when my world's going to come to an end within probably 10, 15 years. I don't know. But I do know at some point my life is going to end. And can I just tell you, if you're at peace with God and you've given your life to Jesus, you can just be at peace across the board. Because at the end of the day, all of us are headed in the same direction. But followers of the Prince of Peace, people who trust in Jesus, ought to be at peace. And so here's what I want to talk to you about in the next few minutes. I want to talk to you about the power of of perspective. And then I want to have a moment of, of prayer with you. And I want to encourage you as, as you pray, would you obviously pray for yourself and protection for your family and friends and all that? I, I know you're already doing that. Uh, would you pray for our leaders? Would you pray that God would give them wisdom? Would you pray for medical personnel that are working on this issue? Would you pray for supernatural involvement from God so that this will come to an end? So pray for wisdom for our leaders, pray for our medical professionals, uh, pray for the people that you know and, and love, and pray for the peace of our communities and, and of, our, of our country. But let's be people of prayer, let's be people of peace, let's be people with, with proper perspective. If you've got a Bible there, turn to Numbers chapter 13. That's in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. We're going to be in chapter 13 today. If you want to grab a pen and a piece of paper, I'm going to give you five things to write down, and I'm going to talk about shifting our perspective, choosing to see things not through eyes of fear, but through eyes of Faith. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current situation today, but I hope to give you some principles here that are in Scripture that will help you uh, with all of your life, all right? So Numbers chapter 13, let me give you a little background here. So Moses has gone to Pharaoh. The Israelites are in Egyptian bondage. And Moses goes and says what? Let my people Let my people go. And God has supernaturally intervened. He's provided miracles. The Red Sea has parted. God has rescued his people out of Egyptian bondage and slavery. Now they're in the wilderness and they're headed to a place called the promised land. A land, the Bible says, flowing with milk and honey. And in Numbers 13, they are literally on the border of God's promises. They've been in the wilderness. They've seen God provide. Now they're on the border of God's promises. They're literally on the border of God's blessing. They're about to enter into the promised land. And so what Moses does is he gets 12 guys together and he says, I want you 12 to go spy out the land and then come back and give a report. And so these 12 guys go, they spy out the land for 40 days. And they come back and they give a report. Now, here's the thing. There's 12 guys, 10 of the guys look at the situation with eyes of fear. And two of these guys, Joshua and Caleb, look at the situation through eyes of faith. If you want to take down some notes, let's talk about what happens when I look with eyes of fear. I'm gonna give you five things. What happens when I look with eyes of fear? Number one, if you wanna write it down. When I look with eyes of fear, I'm stressed out by conflicting information. I'm stressed out by conflicting 
information. Now, how many of you, you can just raise your hand there in your house. You've been stressed out recently by conflicting information. Yeah, me, me too. Uh, it's honestly, it's hard to know what, what to believe. And so we look at all of this and we, you know, this Situation's unprecedented. As a result, with conflicting information and we're not sure, our fear, I, I think, is un, unprecedented. And again, we're talking about the power of, of perspective. Think about this with me. So perspective. Perspective is the way I see things. The way I see things determines how I think about things. How I think about things determines how I feel about things. And how I feel about things usually determines what I'm actually going to do. And when we look at things through eyes of fear, we're stressed out because there'll be conflicting information. Now, right now, you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, that's the media and all that. Listen, this has been going on for thousands of years. Any situation that you deal with, there's going to be two sides to the coin. There's going to be good news and, and bad news. There's always going to be good news, but there's also some bad news. How we deal with that but in between the good news and bad news really determines how our life works out. The power of perspective is huge. It affects how we think, how we think affects how we feel, how we feel affects what we do, how we see things really, really important. So 10 of the 12 come back, they look at the situation through eyes of fear and there's now conflicting information and it's stressing people out. Pick up with me here in Numbers chapter 13 beginning in verse 27. Here's what your Bible says. It says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. It's bountiful. Here is its fruit. Verse 28, but, now I capitalized that word, B-U-T. Say that word, B-U-T, out loud with me. Say it with me. What's the word? The word is, but, there will, there will always be a but. All right, and it's how we handle those big butts that determine whether or not we will go into a place of God's blessing or will stand in fear on the border of God's, of God's blessing. So it flows with milk and honey, the fruit's amazing, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Descendants of Anak. Now, the Anakins are from the tribe of Skywalker. And the force was very strong with them, all right? That's, that's a different story. All you nerds got that joke, didn't you? All right, so here's what we got. The descendants of Anak um, were considered to be very large people. And so when the spies come back, they say, the land is amazing. Milk and honey, the fruit's uh, uh, amazing. How many of you... Um, we're not all together, so no one can see you at the moment other than your friends and family who are with you. But how many of you have ever been to a vineyard? It's okay, you can confess it, it's fine. Been to a vineyard, kind of toured the vineyard. You saw the, the grapes uh, growing on the sticks, right? Maybe at the end of the tour of the vineyard, you had a little communion together, if you know what I'm saying? All right, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. Gonna be wine in heaven, just keeping it real with you right now, all right? In the right now, moderation, but I'm just telling you heaven's going to be good. Okay. Here's the thing. These spies come back and they have the grapes and there's so many grapes on one of those poles. It takes two men to carry them. The, the land is, is bountiful, milk and honey. They are on the border of tremendous blessing. And there's a but. But the people are big there. But there's gonna be some, some challenges. Listen, all of life is gonna have a great big but. Let's just break it down. Um, I'm gonna talk about current situation again in a minute. We're gonna have a prayer time, but right now let's just look of all, uh, all of life, all right? Any situation you are in, there's going to be a great big but. For example, it could be right now you've got some challenges in your marriage. And God wants to bless your marriage but for you to step into those blessings, for you to step into the promised land of your marriage, you're gonna to have to do some work. There's challenges, God has blessing for you, but if you wanna experience the blessing, you've gotta to go to some counseling. You, you gotta you got get some help. It could be that you're single and, and you know, you would like something else in life at, at some point, and you wanna experience God's blessing in your singleness, right? But if you're gonna experience that, you're gonna to have to do things God's way, and it's a little more difficult. Could be right now you're struggling in your finances, and God's blessing is there, 
But for you to experience God's blessing, you're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to manage your money God's way. Maybe even do a budget and those kinds of things. Show some discipline. Choose to be content. There's always a a but. And it's how you and I handle those great big buts. How we handle those is the determining factor of what we experience in, in life. Focus is a big deal. Perspective is a big deal. If you're taking notes, write this down. What I focus on is what I move, move towards. What I focus on is what I move towards. What's amazing to me is I was looking at uh, Apple TV and I was looking through the most popular movies at the moment, like the most rented movies. And besides the, the new ones that are on there, it was movies like, like this. Of course, we got the coronavirus thing situation going on and all of that. And people are watching movies like Contagion, uh, Outbreak, you know, I think Walking Dead's making a comeback because people are thinking about the zombie a- a- apocalypse, you know, all those kinds of things. Listen, when you fill your mind with negative things, you're going to experience negative emotions and you're going to make negative decisions. When you fill your mind with things like that, you are moving in the wrong direction. When you look at life with eyes of fear, there's going to be conflicting information. There's always a, a-, a but. And we can focus on the negative or focus on the, on the positive. I'm not talking about pie in the sky. I'm not talking about daydreaming. In the book of Proverbs, it says that the prudent see danger coming and take refuge. We want to be wise, but listen, we don't want to be people of fear. We want to be people of faith. Look at me. Foolish fear will never serve you. Foolish fear will never serve you. You want to be wise but you want to be calm. You want to make good decisions. Foolishness drives crazy, crazy fear. Listen, when emotions are high, logic is low. And we don't know what to do with conflicting information. As people of God, let's be wise and calm. And because we trust our heavenly father, let's let's be courageous. We're stressed out with conflicting information when we look at things through eyes of fear. When we look at things, things through eyes of fear, number two, we develop a scarcity mentality. A scarcity mentality. Now, how many of you have noticed this? Yeah. Where's the toilet paper, right? We develop a scarcity mentality when we look at life through eyes of fear. This is verse 29. Here's what it says. They come back, they give the report through eyes of fear. Here's what they say. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. What did they just say? There's no more toilet paper. Yes, it's God's promised land, but there's no more room. We develop a scarcity mentality. Have you ever said this? Kind of big picture again, just talking about life principles here. Have you ever said this? All the good jobs are already taken. Have you ever said this? All the good men are already taken. I was talking to a single woman in our church uh, a few weeks ago, and she asked me to pray for her about some things, and she said that in the conversation. All the good men are already taken. And I thought to myself, you only need one, right? And all the ones that you think are good, they're probably not that great, <laughs> okay? You know, that, that kind of, of things. But, but we tend to have this scarcity mentality. I call it chicken little thinking, right? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Have you ever said this? I would get healthy, you know, exercise. Um, I would uh, manage my money. I I, I would do these things that would be better for me, but, because there's always a a but, but I don't have enough time. You have a scarcity mentality when it comes to time. If that's you, let me ask you this question. Uh, How much TV do you watch? It's just something to think about. I wrote this down, and I wrote it down uh, for myself more than anybody Else, but I wrote this down. No one ever made significant improvements to their life by watching more TV. Yeah. Scarcity mentality. Can I just encourage you if you're a Jesus follower? Uh, don't have a scarcity mentality, have a generous mentality. Because your heavenly Father owns everything and He loves and cares for you. When, uh, when I flew home a Friday night, landed, Turned my cell phone back on. I was getting texts from uh, friends who had saw an email go out who attend at Sun Valley, and they were just saying, hey, if you need anything, 
uh, let us know. We know you've been gone. If you need food, let us know. If you need toilet paper, uh, let us let us know. And actually, I said, well, actually, we have toilet paper because when we were out of town and we were, you know, staying where we were, it could be that somebody in our family brought back some toilet paper from the room with them. I'm not going to mention any names, Katrina Moore, but that was it, right? But here's the thing. We had some friends who were already reaching out to us. Not because they had a scarcity mentality, but a generosity mentality that God owns it all and that we can get through this t- together. Um, I'm going to ask you to not be selfish and self-focused through all of this. To pray for others, to provide for your family, but consider the fact that other people are buying toilet paper in the store too. So you know what I'm saying? And let's realize that we're a community that's here to help each other. And let's rise above it. Sun Valley, listen, let's make this hour one of our finest hours. And let's love and lead well through our, through our generosity. But if you look at life through eyes of fear, you'll have a scarcity mentality instead of a generous mentality. Number three, if you choose to look at life through eyes of fear, you will fulfill your own self-defeating prophecies. You will fulfill your own self-defeating prophecies. If you have in your mind, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do this and I can't do that, uh, reality is you won't. If you're taking notes out to the side, write this down. The person who says I can and the person who says I can't are both right. Would you write that down? The person who says I can and the person who says I can't are both right. This is verses 30 and 31. So remember, 10 are looking at the situation through eyes of fear. And two, Joshua and Caleb are looking at the situation through eyes of of faith. Here's what happens, verse 30. So they're all whining and crying and we can't. And here's what Caleb says. It says, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Verse 31, there's that word again. But, but the men who had gone up with Caleb said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Listen, we need more Caleb's in our lives. We need can people in our lives, people who will cheer us on and encourage us. Uh, Right now, besides the virus situation and all that, if if you have people in your life that are can't people, let me give you some pastoral permission. Uh, You can distance yourself from can't people. You're allowed to do that by God and his grace because he, he loves you. Um, there are moments in my life when, quite frankly, I'm emotionally tired. And if, and if there are can't people uh, around me, I will just kind of put up a little boundary for a certain period of time because I do not have the emotional energy. Can anybody relate to what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't be a can't person. Be a can person. You know what let's do? I was talking about it a moment ago in the realm of generosity. But let's speak life and hope and love into people right now. Let's be contagious, but let's be contagious when it comes to wisdom, when it comes to peace, when it comes to calm, when it comes to to love, when it comes to generosity. Let's be can people. We can get through this together. We have a great God and we love God and we're going to choose to love others. And you are not alone and I'm not alone. We have each other. When we look through eyes of fear, we can't, we can't see that. And we kind of put out our own self-defeating prophecies. Oh, we can't. Listen, we can and we will together because we're going to move forward in faith. Number four, when you look at life through eyes of fear, we infect others with our negativity. When I look through things with eyes of, look at things through eyes of fear, I infect others with my negativity. Nothing is so contagious as negativity. Maybe write that down. Nothing is so contagious as as negativity. Have you ever noticed that bad news travels really, really fast and good news travels really, really slow? I'm gonna tell you what you already know. Bad news sells. Everybody thrives, you know, and consumes bad news while good news stays on the shelf. 
when we look at life through eyes of fear, we infect others with something negative, and it's our negativity. Verse 32, so the 10 who were looking at the situation through eyes of fear, here's what they did. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Now, this is the promised land for crying out loud. This is God's provision. The God who provided miracles, parted the Red Sea, all of that for their freedom. But these 10, through eyes of fear, spread the bad report. And they say, the land we explored devours those living in it. Now, let me help you. That's not true. It's not like the the land is eating people, right? All the people we saw there are are of great size. Mark Twain says this, said this, bad news can travel around the world. Bad news can travel around the world while good news is still putting its pants on. And you found that to be true? Listen, you don't want to send out negative. You want to send out positive. Now, let's be real practical with with this here for a a second. Um, When you look at your children, what expression do they see on your face? Like the first expression. Is it positive or negative? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing that you say to your spouse? Is it positive or negative? Negative. Now, it could be you got something negative going on, right? The pipe burst and the bathroom is full of water. But before you tell your spouse that, use these two words with a smile. You ready? Good morning. You're going to get a positive response probably, right? Good morning. Well, I've got good news and bad news because there's always a but, right? There's good news, but there's bad news. The good news is it's a good morning. I love you. The bad news is the bathroom's full of water. But do you see how that works? What you send out is what you... You get back when you walk into the office, your colleagues, your your boss, your fellow employees. What's the first thing they see on your face? Is it it positive or, or negative? We want to be people who don't infect others with our negativity, but we infect others with wisdom and and love. Last one, number five. If we look at things through eyes of fear, number five, we will see ourselves as inadequate and unworthy to meet life's challenges. As inadequate and unworthy to meet life's life's challenges. Out to the side, if you're taking notes, write this. We tend to project our insecurities onto others. We tend to project our insecurities onto onto others. This uh, past summer, I, I spoke at an event, and one of the other speakers was a professor from Biola University. And he told uh, Katrina and I about this uh, study that they did called the SCAR study. And what they did is they took a group of people and they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cosmetically, like Halloween, you know, put a scar on your face. Because we're trying to do a study of how physical appearance affects how others treat you. And so we're going to put a scar on your face. We're going to send you out for a few hours, go to a restaurant, movie, you know, go live life for a few hours and then come back and give us a report. And so they put scars on the people's faces. And then right as they were exiting to go out into the world and live life for a few hours, what the people that were leading the experiment did is they walked over and they said, hey, let me just touch that scar up for a little bit. And then what they actually did was they removed the scar. There was nothing on the person's face. But they thought the scar was there. And so they went out into the world and they lived their life in restaurants and all that. And they came back, gave a report. And here's what they said. Oh, people treated me horribly. Everybody treated me different because of the scar on my face. And there was nothing there. When we look at life through eyes of fear, we project our insecurities onto onto others. And we think they see us a certain way. They see us as inadequate and unworthy. Can I just tell you this? If you've given your life to Jesus, you're a child of God. And in him, you're worthy. And in him, you are fully adequate. And in him, there's nothing to fear. I was talking to an older gentleman the other day, and he said, you know, in my 20s and 30s, I worried about what everybody thought of me. And then in my 40s, he said, I decided I don't care what people think of me. He said, and then I got to be in my 50s, and I realized nobody was thinking of me anyway. Right? They were too busy thinking about what you, what I'm thinking about them. That tends to be how that works. And he said, now that I'm in my 60s, I just think about others and how I can speak positivity and love and wisdom into their lives. And that's, that's where we want to be. That's where we want to be. So, so here's the decision that, that we have to make. Will we look at life through eyes of fear or through eyes of, of faith? What will 
your perspective be? I want to teach you this prayer, and I want to encourage you anytime that you feel worried, uh, anytime that you feel anxious, anytime that you feel overwhelmed, you just take a moment and, and pray this prayer. It's going to come here on the screen, and if you like, you can, you can write it down, but I'm going to ask you just to repeat it after me. Repeat this prayer after me as it comes here on the screen. Would you say, Father, help me to see what you see. I believe you love me. And I choose to trust you and move forward in faith. It begins, Father, help me to see what you see. Give me proper perspective. Remind me of your love for me so that I'll trust you and then I'll move forward in, in faith. Write this prayer down. Take it. Pray it over people. And in this season of some uncertainty, let's choose to look at life, not through eyes of fear, but through eyes of faith. Let's take a moment and pray together. Would you pray with me? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And I'm just going to lead us uh, in a time of, of prayer. But with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, can I just tell you, disruption brings perspective. Disruption brings perspective. And it could be in this time of disruption, it could be that we need to change our perspective. Can I just tell you in the end, all that matters is God and people. And it could be in this time of disruption, we just need to repent of focusing on the wrong things. And we need to choose in this moment to remember what matters most. Let's look at life, let's look at people through eyes of faith. Let me pray for us. Father, help us to see what you see. Help us to know your love for us so that we might trust you. And may we move forward in faith. May we love and lead others well. Father, we pray for our leaders. Give them wisdom. We pray for um, medical personnel people who are researching it and working hard, people who are dealing with varying issues locally, just across the board. We ask for supernatural provision. And Father, we ask for deliverance and protection. We pray for ourselves and for our families. May we be prudent, may we be wise. We ask you to guard us. Father, for people who are dealing with the virus, we ask that you would heal them. For people who are a little more vulnerable, we ask that you would give them wisdom of extra precaution. And Father, may we as a church rise above our fears and be people of faith. And may this be, as a people of God, one of our finest hours. Teach us, we pray. Help us to see what you see. Help us to know your love, and may we trust you and represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen.